Welcome to Bible Breath, where we dig into the Word of God to catch our breath for whatever's coming next. Today, we continue to answer a very important question, the question of who is God according to God. And today, we're going to be talking about God the Son. You may recall that the Bible reveals God as three persons in one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is not God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is not God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father or God the Son. And yet, God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. Three persons, one God. Today, we're going to be talking about God the Son, that Jesus, God the Son, is not like anyone, that Jesus is just like everyone, and that Jesus is the only possible Savior for everyone, including you. Let me begin by telling you a story about Casey. <laughs> it's a familiar story to many. It's a story called Casey at the Bat. It's about a baseball team that was at the end of a baseball game. It's the Mudville baseball team, and they were losing. They were down to their last batter in their last inning, but thankfully Casey, their best batter, came up to the plate, and everybody was very, very excited, expe expecting that with one swing of the bats, Casey was going to win the game for everyone. I hate to blow the ending for you if you haven't read the story, but Casey ended up striking out. He disappointed everyone. Everyone put their hope in him, but the person they put their hope in disappointed them. Now, that was a baseball game. It's a fictional story, not a big deal. But your life is a big deal. Your soul is a big deal. Your salvation is it's a big deal. Your heart is a big deal. And we want to put our hope in something and someone that won't disappoint you in the end. That's who Jesus is. We'll talk about why that is by talking about who he is. Firstly, Jesus, according to the Bible, is not like anyone. There were any number of things that Jesus did that no one else can do. For example, one day his disciples were out in the boat, out in the water. Jesus was on the shore as far as they knew until they looked out on the water and they saw Jesus walking toward them. I can't do that. I walk out onto a lake and I sink right down into the sand underneath the water. Jesus walked on top of the water. Human beings can't do that. Jesus multiple times interacted with people who had died. But then Jesus raised them back to life simply by speaking to them, by saying, get up, be alive. And they were. Jesus was at a wedding once and they had run out of wine the preferred beverage at weddings at the time. And just with the word of his mouth, he changed the water that was there into wine, and the best wine that anyone had ever tasted. Jesus once was surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. The Bible tells us there were 5,000 men, but there were also women and children. It could have been 12,000 or 20,000 or grand total of many, many multiple thousands, and all they had to feed everyone was five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus told his disciples to start handing out the bread and the fish. The disciples were skeptical that it was going to work. But eventually it did. Eventually it did. There was enough food for everyone. Jesus made that happen. Because Jesus can do things that no human being can. The Bible tells us why. The Bible tells us that the reason why is because Jesus is God. And this was the case from the very beginning of Jesus' entrance into our world. In Luke chapter 1, Jesus' earthly mother, Mary, the woman who gave birth to him, was visited by an angel. And the angel announced to Mary, you're going to be giving birth to a child, but it was going to be a very special child. And Mary had a question about how that was going to happen since she was a virgin. She had never been with a man. How will this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, well, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and the Holy One to be born of you will be called the Son of God. That's one of multiple times in the Bible that Jesus is identified as the Son of God, connecting Jesus with God himself. Jesus also connected him with God himself. Back when Moses in the Old Testament, you might remember him, back when Moses was called to be the leader of the Israelites to set them free from slavery in Egypt, God appeared to him in a burning bush. And when Moses approached the bush and when God explained to Moses what was going to happen, 
Moses asked, well, who is this that's sending me? What is your name? And God answered, my name is I am. Which maybe sounds like a strange answer. But Jesus used that answer later on in his ministry with some of the people in the church who were skeptical of Jesus. They were confronting Jesus, trying to prove that Jesus wasn't who he said he was. And they were, they were talking about Abraham. And Jesus had made reference to knowing Abraham and seeing Abraham. And they thought, well, how can that be? Abraham's been dead for a very, very long time. And, and Jesus said, well, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am, he said. And they would have gotten the point. They would have known that at that moment, Jesus was referring to himself as God, as God himself. So because Jesus did things that only God can do, because the Bible refers to Jesus as God, the Son of God in particular, and because Jesus referred to himself as God, it's obvious that Jesus was not like anyone. He could do things that only God can do. And yet on the other hand, Jesus was just like everyone, including you and me. In Mark chapter 11, it says very simply that Jesus was something you and I are very often. Jesus was hungry. In John chapter 19, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said out loud, I am thirsty. In John chapter 4, it says that Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, he sat down by the well to rest. Jesus was hungry, Jesus was thirsty, Jesus was tired, just as every human being is, just as you and I often are. And the reason Jesus was hungry and thirsty and tired is, of course, because Jesus was a real human being. Go back to Luke chapter 1 again when the angel came to visit Mary. And Mary asked, well, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Jesus was born as a human being, just like you and I were born as a human being. Jesus is also identified as a human being almost a hundred times in the Bible. Uh, one example is in Matthew chapter 12, where it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Almost 100 times the Bible refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. Many of those by Jesus himself. The Bible and Jesus talk about Jesus like he is a human being because he is. Jesus, in that sense, is just like everyone. He did things that every human does. And so there you have two very important points. That Jesus Christ is God. And Jesus Christ is a human being. He was a real man. Both of those things at the same time. Not like half and half. There's a character in the, in the Batman comics named Two-Face, who is a uh, who has two personalities, and you can see it visually represented in his face. On one side of his face, it's it's very ugly and dark and and, uh, and just not very good, and the other side of his face is very, very normal. And he flips a coin to decide which way he is going to act. And if it, the coin comes up on one end, then he acts in the good way. And if it ends up on the other end, then he decides to act in the bad way. He's half and half. He's never both of them at the same time. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus was 100% God. He could do absolutely everything at any time that God himself could do. But he was also 100% a human being, just like you and me. There was never a time when he was on earth when he was not entirely a human being. He is 100% God and 100% a human being. He wasn't always like that. The Son of God is eternal. Just as God is eternal, he's been from the very beginning, which goes back, he's always, he's always been around. That's a little bit beyond what our brains can conceive, but, but he's always been around. But there was a moment when Jesus became uh, not only fully God, as he's been from the beginning, but also a human being. There was a start date to his humanity. And the start date is, well, what we've talked about already a couple of times from Luke chapter 1. The angel announced it to Mary. He said, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And that was the moment at Jesus' conception that, according to Colossians chapter 2, that in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lived in bodily form. All the fullness of God 
lived in human form. There's a word for that. The moment that the Son of God took on human flesh and became a human, just like every one of us. The word for that is incarnation. Incarnation. And that's one of our Bible buzzwords. Uh, the word incarnation, which literally means in the flesh. It refers to the moment that the Son of God took on human flesh and became a human being and dwelt here among us. The moment that he was conceived in the womb of a virgin. Something else to take note of in that conversation with Mary and the angel that's significant. Mary was a sinful human being, just like every other human being is sinful, because her parents were sinful and they passed along their sin to their daughter, Mary. And so when Mary asked, well, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She, was, she could have also been asking in a sense, well, how will the Son of God be born to someone like me? If he's God, he can't be sinful. And it's significant that how the angel answered when the angel said, well, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's like, true, Mary, you are a sinful human being who would normally give birth to a sinful child, but the power of the Most High, God's holiness and perfection, will be more powerful than your natural sin, and it will overpower that so that there will be no sin in this child. And so the fullness of the deity, the fullness of God, then, will be able to live as God in human flesh. And why is this important? Why is it important that Jesus, the Son of God, had to be both God and human in one person? I want you to think about it like this. I want you to imagine that you are sitting in the stands watching a basketball game. And imagine that one of the players on your team that you are cheering for is playing very, very poorly, so poorly that you have the thought, I think I could play better than that person in the basketball game. And you decide to do something about it. You decide that you are going to go down to the scorer's table and you are going to check yourself into that basketball game so that you can go and substitute yourself for that player so that they sit on the bench and you go and play and you try to win the game for your team. Would the people at the scorer's table allow you to do that? <laughs> no, of course not. Because you need to be on the team in order to help the team. In order to be a substitute that can come into the game and help your team, you need to be a part of that team. Now, because you're not on the team, there are some benefits to that. Like as you're sitting in the stands, you can't be called for traveling up in the stands. They can't penalize you for breaking any of the rules because since you're not on the team, you're not subject to the same rules that the team you're watching is subject to. What does that have to do with Jesus and us? This. We are on the team of humanity. And we need help. And if Jesus was going to get into the game to help us, he needed to be on our team. If he was going to come in and act as a substitute to help us and to attempt to win the game for us, he needed to be on our team so that he could play by the same rules that we are subject to. The book of Galatians talks about this in Galatians chapter 4, which says, when, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, so he's human there, born under the law. He became human so that he could be subject to the same rules that you and I are subject to, so that he could be on the same team, so that he would be in a position to help us. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says that he came to help, and a part of the help was hard. That he was going to be tempted in every way, just as we are. Every temptation you go against, Jesus went up against. Every struggle in your flesh that, that you deal with, Jesus was going to deal with. He was going to go up against all the same enemies that you and I do. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, the writer of the Hebrews says, yet he did not sin. Our Savior, the person who saves us, needed to be human so that he could go to battle against the same temptations you and I face, the same enemies that we go up against, so that he could be on our team to help us. But he also needed to be God to be able to do things that you and I can't, in particular, so that he could overcome those enemies in ways that you and I don't. I call this the Luke Walton rule. You may have no idea who Luke Walton is, and that's okay. Many people don't. Luke Walton was a professional basketball player, and he was on a professional basketball team, and I believe he has two championship rings, two of them. However, you can make a strong case that he didn't earn a single one of them. Because as his team was playing in those championship games, he never really got on the court all that much. Not unless the game was way out of hand, not unless 
Um, not unless uh, somebody needed just a little bit of a breather, but Luke Walton, he didn't really he didn't really help the team win. He was never really on the court. He was on the bench for most of those games. But even though he was on the bench, not contributing, not helping, not scoring, not stealing the ball, not stopping the other team, he still has championship rings, and he has the right to call himself a champion because he was on the team. His teammates are the ones who actually won the games for him. His teammates are the ones who earned him the championship. Yet he still has the right to call himself a champion. And that's, in a sense, what Jesus came to do for us. In Romans chapter 5, it says, Just as through the disobedience of the one man, that's Adam in the Garden of Eden, the many were made sinners, we inherit his sin. So also through the obedience of the one man, through the ability to play the game of life perfectly and follow the rules perfectly, by Jesus' ability to do that, it says, the many, that's you and me, we will be made righteous, perfect. Looked at by God as people who have won the championship. Jesus became the God-man, fully God, fully man, so that he could be subject to God's laws and, and keep those laws for us. This, uh, this leads to another Bible buzzword something you might hear is from time to time as you hear about Jesus, and that is the word substitute. A substitute is basically somebody who takes the place of another to accomplish what could not be carried out by the first person. We cannot keep God's laws perfectly. We cannot win the game of life. We cannot save ourselves or anyone else in all of humanity. But we have a substitute who came in to do that for us. That substitute is Jesus, fully man, fully God. What's another reason Jesus had to be fully man and fully God? Very simply, Jesus needed to, needed to die. And you can't do that unless you're a human being. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, since, uh, since the children, that's us, have flesh and blood, Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. Very simply, our Savior needed to die for our sins. And that's one of the reasons that the person who saves us had to be a human being so that he was physically, literally able to die. And yet, he also needed to be God so that he could offer a life that was valuable enough, perfect enough to pay the bill on our sins. Remember, the wages of sin is death. We've looked at that passage before. We owe God life. We owe God. We owe God everything we have. We owe God death. That's what we earn. That's what we merit as we rack up the bill on all of our sins. Jesus came to pay that bill for us with a life that was valuable enough that God would accept. Jesus became both God and man so that he could die and by his death pay for the sins of the entire world. Now, we just threw a lot at you there. <laughs> so to quickly summarize... I'll say this. So Jesus, the Bible identifies, Jesus we call a true man. We call him true man, like truly a human being, because he did things that human beings do. The Bible calls him human. Jesus himself refers to himself as human. Jesus is also a true God. He did things that only God can do. And the Bible calls him God. And Jesus calls himself God. Jesus, who was already a true God, became also truly a human being at what we call the incarnation when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that as true God and true man, as true man, he could be born under the law so that he could be placed on our team to qualify himself as a legitimate substitute, but then also as true God so that he could keep the laws perfectly in our place. He was a human being so that he was able to die. And he was true God to give God a sacrifice that was valuable enough, perfect enough, to save us, to cover the bill on all of our sins. And this leads to two more Bible buzzwords, active obedience and passive obedience. They have to do with what exactly Jesus did or did not do in order to be our Savior. Active obedience is uh, what Jesus actively did that we could not do. In other words, the perfect life of obedience that Jesus led to replace the sinful life that we lead. He was our, he was our substitute. He actively followed the commandments. He actively loved God with all of his heart perfectly. But then there's passive obedience, which is 
Jesus passively suffering the punishment that we deserve in our place. You know, when Jesus allowed himself to be beaten and to be hung on a cross, even though he didn't deserve it, and even though he had the power to stop it, he was passive in allowing that to happen to him. Active obedience and passive obedience. Two different aspects to how Jesus uniquely serves as the Savior of all people. And so that leads to a couple of important points that you want to keep in mind related to Jesus and how it is that he saves us. It's an important point that whoever saves us had to be both true God and truly human for all the reasons that we've already stated. And compare that to all the other religions and all the other religious books and religious leaders that you hear about in the world. What the Bible teaches about Jesus being fully God and fully a human being is entirely unique compared to any other religion. And if the person who saves us needed to be fully God and also fully human in order to save us, that means Jesus uniquely qualifies to be the Savior. Another important point. We often say that Jesus saved us by dying on the cross for us. And that's true. But it's incomplete. He also needed to play the game of life perfectly for us as a member of our team, as our substitute. It wasn't just the bill that needed to be paid. It was the perfect life that needed to be led. And Jesus did. He's not like anyone. He's just like everyone. And Jesus is the only possible savior for every one, including you. I want to read you a section from Matthew chapter 18. Jesus is talking and he says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. I bet I know something about you. Something that's true about you that is also true about me. Sometimes you're the one that wanders off. Sometimes you're the one that gets distracted from focusing on God's love for you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes you're the one that gives into a temptation a little bit more quick, more quickly than you would have imagined. Sometimes you're the one that worries. Sometimes you're the one that is afraid. Sometimes you're the, sometimes you're the one that wonders if God really loves you or if you're really going to be okay. Jesus told that little story about the sheep to remind you why he came. He came as someone who was not at all like us, who was so much greater than any of us. And also as somebody who is just like us, who gets you, who knows everything you face, who knows your challenges because he's felt them and experienced them. He came as that unique individual to remind you that you don't need to worry. You are going to be okay. Because the only person who is uniquely qualified to save your soul, he already did. He already did. You are the one who already belongs to him.